Yeah, I think, to be perfectly honest, Joe is maybe the most fleshed out character out of the group here. Because we find out, episode four, I want to say it is, that his mother and a sibling, I can't remember if it was a a sister or brother, they died in an accident. And really, ever since that accident, his dad does nothing but sit at home and drink. And therefore, Joe kind of just takes care of his dad and himself. Uh, Welcome uh, to Go, Go, Kaiju Show. uh, (laughs) We have a very healthy obsession with Kaiju. uh, I am your co-host, Ken. That means your other cup was full of Jason. Oh. Hey guys, what's up? <laughs> if you don't know why, what I'm doing, uh, then you probably haven't watched Gamma Rebirth, the topic of our show today. Uh, what I might even end up subtitling as the gasping anime. <laughs> <laughs> for those, um, for those of you probably watch the English dub. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, the English dub, man, holy mackerel. Like, all the gasping. I know, it. like, Jason and I, we were talking about, I understand it's part of anime, but I I don't think I've ever, I mean, I'm not a huge anime watcher to begin well, with, but out of the few animes that I have watched, I don't think I've heard as much gasping as I had with this one. <laughs> mainly when it comes to the English dub, I sort of noticed that maybe a little bit in the original uh, uh, mm-hmm. Japanese versions will get a little bit of that but yeah um growing up when watching the animes when there are english dubs and stuff you'll get that quite a bit (laughs) yeah so uh we're covering gamma rebirth the recent uh gamma mini series anime that was released on netflix about april if i'm not mistaken it's also known as gamma versus five kaiju Mm -hmm. as well but also just want to say we're back after a little a month and a half. <laughs> <laughs> well, we but said we were going to be on a hiatus. We just didn't know when we were coming back. Yeah, and by this recording, hopefully, we should be able we sh- we should totally be getting the uh, uh, the previous episode up. Been a little bit busy around here, also at times forgetting <laughs> to do it. But uh, yeah, so it should obviously be up by the uh, the time uh, this episode gets out. Yeah, and Jason already released my little commentary on uh, that involves me personally explaining why I am leaving the Godzilla community. And as of us recording this particular episode, it's already gotten like 29, 30 views, which, and it's only been up for like 19 hours or something like that. Yeah, just under. Uh, I was kind of shocked at how many views it's gotten already. But um, yeah, same here. I, well, yeah, and and I appreciate that for those of you that have seen it. If not, it's definitely up on our YouTube page. Is that going to end up being in an audio f- version too on iTunes? Uh, not that I uh, was, I wasn't really planning on it uh, in a way, but I was. I forgot to upload it on the uh, the Rumble page of ours, but I should add that to my list of things <laughs> to do. <laughs> After this recording. <laughs> yeah, so it's definitely up on the YouTube page. I uh, really appreciate, uh, again, the number of views it's already received. I hope that um, uh, everyone takes it to heart and not only does some personal introspection, but at the same time kind of helps to make the fandom better. That doesn't mean I'm coming back <laughs> um, because I've made up my mind and I said no mas. So, um yeah, check that out. You know, I'm I don't normally plug myself um, unless I well, use cheese. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I I I I'm I looked at that 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 was the first time really since I recorded it that I actually watched it and and just listened. Um, I'm pretty, if I say so myself, I'm pretty impressed with how I did that. So. Um, Please watch it and share it and all that because I do think it's important. Um, because I'm important. No, <laughs> but I'm the one I, that's I, important around here because I do all the work. Is not too dissimilar from those that are like me in some ways, and you'll know that when you watch it and, and listen to it. But yeah, 
check that out. That that's up already. Of course, by the time you see this, the thing will have already been up for like a week. So <laughs> or two weeks, whichever. <laughs> yeah, when, whenever Jason <laughs> gets around to it. So um just sort of a an FYI moving forward now through the remainder of this year, and I think even to the early part of next year. Um we it's are that moving, time of the year. <laughs> yeah, we're moving podcast recordings to Sundays now. So I don't know if episode releases are going to be similar or day later. I'm not sure uh, because we're not doing these live anymore. Most of you probably aren't going to care. Um, but uh, recordings are Sundays moving forward instead of Saturdays. And after today, uh, our next, I think, two episodes are going to be. Well, actually, no, I take that back. Excuse me. Our next episode is going to be covering the new Ultraman Rising Netflix movie. And then after that, I we should do two episodes uh, dedicated to the Netflix Ultraman anime. And I think or what possibly we mean, three, whichever. Possibly, yeah. So we'll either do three episodes where we cover each season, then the final episode of that series would cover not just season three, but an overall review. Or if we were to go to the two episode route, we would cover seasons one and two, and up in the first podcast dedicated to that and then the final podcast would be season three plus a general uh overview if we were to go that route so a a lot of netflix anime (laughs) coming your way here we're finally getting around to some of that some of that i've been wanting to get to especially the anime ultraman (laughs) finally getting around to that after a few so years since well the season three i think that came out last year if i believe so but I know. So, I mean, but, we're a year late, but yeah. but I know the first season came out when I was still li- living up in Minneapolis. So yeah. it's been out at least a few so years. Yeah, because I watched the first episode of that anime when it first came out, however many years ago. But I never went any farther than that. So uh, I'm very interested to see kind of how that progresses because if I say so myself, and this is sort of showing my hand a little bit for what we're going to be talking about here in this episode, I kind of dug a lot of the anime uh, kaiju stuff, the Godzilla stuff, as you all well know when we covered SP and the anime trilogy of Godzilla films. And so, uh, and again, like I said, showing my hand, I'm digging Gamma Rebirth. Um, so I'm kind of curious as, as to how that's going to go. Mm-hmm. So before we proceed, Jason, is there anything you would like to say or do or not do or, <laughs> well, if you're, if you're watching us on, uh, uh, any of the video platforms that were available on, if you see a subscribe button down below or above, wherever you're watching us from, make sure to hit that subscribe button as well as smash the like button. And then if you're listening to the audio versions of our, uh, show make sure to subscribe to us on your favorite audio platform oh and one thing i uh, forgot to mention too because I, w- I already talked about kind of what we're doing moving forward once we are done covering all the netflix stuff here we are getting back to common writer and that yes. will <laughs> probably take up most of the rest of the year more than likely and then probably uh parts of the new year next year potentially depending upon how all this works yeah. out. So. Yeah, because we, we just sort of want to take the band off <laughs> from yeah. what we've seen in the first half. It, it well, started out good, but then it's like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, w- I brought up an idea uh, for Jason. I don't think we uh, really solidified it for sure as far as what we're going to do for the year end. Usually, historically, our year end episodes have been uh, involving like a general overview of the year. And we just kind of pick randomly what we do. It's like a potpourri. Top five episode. Stuff, yeah. And I think uh, we might do something a little bit different uh, for the year end episode this year. I had suggested to Jason that our year end episode focus on 70 years of Godzilla. So in, in some way, uh, once again, we're kind of just in a very general broad sense, talking about the uh, character's legacy, some of the films, uh, just what it's meant to cinema and, and all that. So, you know, you're talking about um, the 70th year celebration of Godzilla. I know 10 years ago we had um, Josh, Cat, and Pat on 10 years ago when we did the, the whole 60th anniversary celebration. And that was, we did that right on uh, 
the 60th anniversary of Godzilla. And it looks like two uh, this year, the third is going to be right on Sunday too. So mm. there you go. So there's, there's sort of a suggestion of us possibly doing it on that day uh, too. But I don't know if you maybe want to bring them back on after. Because I think that was the last time we had them on. The last time we had him on was in 2016 when we did the Shin Godzilla. Oh, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Him on. Yeah, that's right. We uh, need to get him back on. That was fun. Yeah, one of these times. So, yeah, that's that's just kind of something uh, something for you to think about uh, there. So, And then also, we're just two episodes away from uh, episode 200, too. Hard to believe. <laughs> We've been at this for how many years, and we're finally getting to 200, but that's not counting. Yeah, 14 14 years. That's not counting, though, like our commentary episodes and all that. If you count all the commentary, like sort of bonus episodes we've done, yeah, we've definitely done like probably 250, if not more than that. But yeah, I mean, we had that year and a half off, and then we take like a month and a half or so off after G-Fest, so... There's a lot of missed opportunities. We could have had like a <laughs> yeah. thousand podcasts at this point. <laughs> well, and then doing it weekly and then going to bi-weekly and then, then monthly, and then just kind of whenever. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, recently we went back to doing it weekly, but then we decided, ah, we'll go back to going back to bi-weekly here. <laughs> I think it just it makes more sense because part of it was because we started hating ourselves for like for covering Spectre Man and Common Rider for while. Probably. Like, oh, dear God, <laughs> we're ready to like hit ourselves over the head with a mallet. Well, and then doing it uh, live too, it just yeah, it's like we didn't get really much out of it. I think well, we had just doing pre-recording and then well, and we had uh, issues too. That too. Although we do get a little bit of issues when we do these pre-recordings and stuff, but not no, as bad. Many, <laughs> yeah, not as bad. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right. So getting into Gamma Rebirth, it is a six episode mini series. It's on Netflix. There's also DVDs of it uh, out there. Both Jason and I, we have uh, DVD copies, legitimate DVD copies of this uh, mini series. So just as a general overview of what the story is, the story takes place in 1989 with these two boys in Japan, and they get themselves initially involved with the Gauss versus Gamera battle. Then they're ending up being um, sought upon by the Eustace Foundation, which they uh, recruit them, and then they later find out, the boys do, that the Eustace Foundation is part of this really old like cult that um, has had some control over the kaiju and that in order to bring the mummified corpse of Virus back to life, they need to feed it children. And one child in particular has to have some special code type of DNA that ultimately makes Virus, uh, I think, more powerful. Well, Brings- not only that, but then have any of the kaiju multiply and then um, yeah. do a population control. But in the in the Japanese version, uh, this Eustace uh, uh, corp or whatever you call foundation. it, uh, the group, uh, yeah, they call it the foundation. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then ultimately, Gamera comes in, fights technically six kaiju. And then uh, ultimately ends up saving the day, but then in an attempt to destroy the four leaders of the foundation who are based on the moon, uh, he has to supercharge himself and ultimately drains him of his body, uh, just, I guess, bodily life life force, for lack of a better term, and ends up, he doesn't technically die because i think he turns into a baby again did, did i understand that correctly yeah. that ending? he turns actually well, back into a baby or did he leave an egg somehow it seems like the way it looked like he probably left some sort of uh egg per se like it was him, but, kinda, but maybe but, not him but yeah and in, in, in the end he, you could say in the end he thanos himself <laughs> <laughs> well, <they> had... <laughs> <laughs> yeah because well hence the name gamma rebirth mm-hmm. um 
and then it ends on that. So that's a real general overview of kind of what this six episode series is about. I don't know, Jason, like, do we want to cover it like um, episode by episode or just as a whole? I would just say as a whole, because yeah. many of these episodes just pretty much go one after another, like, well, yeah, it, the, it's directly off. Yeah, it's one big story cut into episodes. Um, I just didn't know if we wanted to like do episode by episode for you can reasons. say it's like you can say Excuse it's me. like a serial serialization of a movie, but just cut into episodes. Yeah, each episode on average runs about 42 minutes, give or take a few minutes. 40, 40 45 minutes, somewhere around there. Yeah. Yeah. I think the longest one runs at like 46 or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, you you would think we would be good at this, but because we dealt with Spectre Man and Common Rider so much over the last <laughs> couple of years, we've sort of gotten rusty in this area. And I know I've said it before, but um like how do we want to tackle this? Like, um let's talk about, I guess, the different uh let's let's talk about the kaiju themselves. Let's talk about what kaiju are in here and sort of how they were given sort of a new facelift. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and before before we started, you sort of asked me at what I thought of them. At first, when we got the initial designs and when this uh, uh, mini series was announced for Netflix, and they revealed uh, the designs of uh, the kaiju and stuff. At first, I was a little bit mixed on the, sort of the look. It, it kind of gave me that. Um, the SP vibes, uh, sort of speak where they were kind of the slender, you know, kind of a little bit of a, a weird look to them. I mean, it's going to be sort of like that. And I, I don't know the specific name to, uh, put, put on them, but, uh, yeah, it, I sort of have a mixed feeling about it at first, but until, uh, the last uh, couple or so days when initially watching uh, the anime, uh, just looking at the execution and their reactions to the environment and everything else, I was fairly surprised and uh, kind of surpassed my expectations in a way with how the kaiju uh, performed here and how they maneuvered um uh, and everything i the kaiju designs have really grown on me and their um and how they reacted to basically everything yeah uh, for me personally i love the designs and i love how um not only did they not only the redesigns of of the kaiju in question but also how they go about um, using some of their abilities and, and, and powers that we have come to know, know them to have. Well, um, and then some of them that they had uh, powers that we've never even seen in the original uh, movies, per se, especially when it comes to uh, Virus, where he had like this laser beam coming out from his head where he opens it up. Kind of looks like a satellite in a way, and then he has. He this, reminds me of the aliens from Independence Day, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> and then he has this uh, gravity sort of uh, flying thing. <laughs> yeah, he he's able to manipulate gravity, but we find out Gamera can too. Of course, yeah. <laughs> That's one of the things I want to say before I forget. That's one of the things that I like about this anime that they continue to incorporate with the Gamera character is that Gamera. Once again, just like he does in all of his movies, pulls abilities out of his butt. And especially, <laughs> like, especially with this anime where he like uses his uh, flying sauce, saucer ability to just saw these <laughs> uh, other kaiju in half. He only literally. did it once. He cut gear on in half. He did, and then the same thing with Virus, too, when they were out space. With Virus, though, he was in his flying mode, but was just a torpedo. Like, he just was his flying self and just, like, bursted himself. And then in the uh, the final episode where he sort of used the flying saucer, but then just completely went into this energy ball 
sort of thing against this uh, Queen Gauss and just pummels her and just <laughs> fries her to death. <laughs> well, and you were talking to me earlier about the Easter egg of the lighthouse. Did you notice with the Easter egg of, I think it was against Jiger, the flaming hand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I noticed that. It's like, that's so three. obvious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for me, I really dig the new designs. Zegra is basically specifically all aquatic, more or less. And, and he's virtually uh, useless on land. Unlike uh, the Showa era version where, yeah, he's still not great on land, but at least he can move around a little bit more than this particular version can. Mm -hmm. uh, Jiger, I would say, is... I would say Jiger is... Well, it's, I think it's sort of a toss-up between Jiger and Gauss as far as being the ones that are closest to their show and Heisei versions. I would say um, I, I'm, I don't think uh, Jiger wasn't quite as close, but I would at least say as far as maybe the head appearance is kind of close. But yeah, I would say the closest one would obviously be uh, Gauss. And Jiger, what was interesting is that even though Jiger had like that, um, for lack of a better term, sort of an opal type of deal like on it in between its eyes, it never used it in mm. this episode because back in the show of film, it used it as like a heat beam. It never used it here in the series. So I don't know why they even included it. And then its tail is more of like a scorpion's tail where it's about poking, uh, but it doesn't impregnate uh, Gamera when he like stabs Gamera like a handful of times. So yeah, uh, there's no eggs being inserted or anything like that. It's, it's just a specific jabbing weapon. Um, uh, Gauss, I mean, is Gauss. Um, I, you know, I, I can't really say much more than that. Gauss is me, Gauss. It definitely <laughs> reminds me of the, definitely like the Heisei version of Gauss. And maybe um, that uh, CGI version uh, kind of short film of Gamera that they showed yeah. back in 2016. And speaking of which, on that front, this Gamera designs kind of reminds me of that Gamera from that short film in a way. Just how yeah. it looks. I want to get to Gamera here in a bit. Yeah. Um, and then, like I said, we already talked about Jiger. I really like Jiger, kind of a slender version of that character. Gearon is really cool. Like Gearon's knife head is like. Basically, its entire head, it's almost like a helmet, per se. And even and its mouth field, opens up yeah. like, an, uh, like a mandible, almost. And very agile. Yeah, what I love about Gearon is, like, he, like, acrobatically flips himself around, and that gives him the ability to really put force behind uh, his head chomps. Mm-hmm. Genius. I thought that was one of the most clever things that they did with any of these kaiju was giving gear on sort of that ability so that it could put more force behind its chops. Um, Virus is spectacular as well. This character that is in a film that a lot of people, a lot of gamer fans, I think more or less kind of enjoy, but sort of poke fun at Virus here is one powerful dude. And very creative as well, because like you were mentioning, its head opens up and can shoot like this very powerful laser. Uh, its tentacles are able to uh, do suction and, and be sort of like jet propulsion as well. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a kaiju character that is sort of um, kind of the kind of the big bad, more or less. Tech, sort of. And then... The, I, they never gave it a specific name, at least from what I heard. But the final kaiju is sort of this, what I'm going to call an Uber Gauss. It was a sort of modified odd number of years earlier during the time that this story takes place. It's a significantly bigger version of Gauss. It's got more of like a bad ear type of, of head. And it's so big, it can't really fly. It kind of crawls and swims. Yeah. Similar to how oh I forgot Zegra. Um, similar to Zegra here, and um, it has this tongue that it shoots into Gamera, and it shoots in like an I think it's like a mRNA type of goop 
where the Eustace Foundation is able to then control Gamera after he destroys that Gauss. Zegra is specifically like waterbound. Um, very cool version of this character. Um, and then Gamera yeah. himself, one of my favorite designs of this Gamera. I, I love it. And in fact, just in general, I love these designs so much that I bought a Gamera figure from this anime earlier oh, in the year. And then yeah, no, the G Fest, you I can see it. You can see rest. mine right right there. And I showed it uh, in the uh, the last episode. I'm surprised there. that they never made uh, that Uber gear on. I mean, not gear on Uber. Yeah, yeah. In the uh, in the original uh, Japanese audio, they tend to call this a queen type of Gauss, mm -hmm. like a queen Gauss in a way. Just you know, with how big it is and how it looks, and obviously, but uh, yeah, they didn't really give it much of a name. But yeah, it's, it had like four eyes essentially, and then I think you could probably Maybe say it was six. I thought. You could probably say it could be like they m must have added some uh, various genes from other uh, from other ka uh, kaiju or something of the sort genetically modified it mm -hmm. um, in a way. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, like the Gamera design was really cool. Kind of remind me of that uh, 2016 short film version and then yeah as far as this uh queen gauss that one was uh uh really cool too it would have been nice if they would have used uh uh one of the uh kaiju that they were supposed uh they that they were thinking about using i forget the name it started with a g and they had in that uh, 2016 short film uh there garuda not garuda I don't. I don't think it was called Garuda. I thought it was maybe Garuda, but uh, yeah, it would have. That would have been nice, or at least Legion or Iris, one of those uh, variants that they could. have I was uh, surprised Barogon wasn't involved because yeah, basically this was Showa era kaiju, but for whatever reason they didn't include Barogon. Yeah, now now that you think about, it, I, was, I <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure the. Uh, the reason behind that they didn't use uh, Barugan mm -hmm. uh, for this one, I'm not. That's that's for them to uh, answer that question. So, <laughs> yeah, I just I found it weird because Barugan. I think even though most fans, at least in the West, are sort of ho hum on that film, I think Barugan still got a pretty decent following uh, here, even in the states, despite the fact that most people are meh on the film itself even though i think it's really one of the better game films mm -hmm. um if i'm being objective about it <laughs> <laughs> i mean it is well written it's a, it's a fantastic film very well written and just fantastically made as well mm -hmm. um so what about the characters here we got uh, you know our four main kid characters you got boko who is the youngest of the group you got joe who is kind of his close friend uh, Junichi, who is kind of the nerd of the group and is a girl. And then uh, kind of later later in episode one, and for sure by episode two, you would get this American uh, boy named Brody, Brody Douglas involved. His dad is the general of the um, uh, U.S. forces in Fasa, if I remember the place's name correctly. Um, and then you got Tazuki, who I believe... Uh, He's not Japanese, I don't think. Well, I thought he was like obviously. an American or something like that. <laughs> the, na the name um, obviously gives it away. Um, and then you got Emiko, who uh, turns out, as we find out by episode five, I believe it is, it is kind of the big bad. Well, she's sort one of the bads in the series here because sort of the bad, but she, she wanted to take revenge against yeah. her aunt that killed her mother. Yeah, and so she's trying to revive Virus and not only trying to more or less do what the Eustace Foundation has been trying to do for a number of years, but trying to do it more of her own way to try to maybe control Virus and the other Kaiju herself. But then she ends up getting eaten by the baby version of the uh, Queen Gauss in uh, Episode 6. Mm -hmm. So um, 
Yeah, there, there's kind of like with a lot of these animes, there's always some sort of twist somewhere mm-hmm. where some character isn't always what they seem to be. Um, I right. think our characters, by and large, are pretty decently well done. Um, I would say, though, we don't necessarily get fully fleshed out characters. We do obviously get a general idea of what kind of characters they are. But as far as like their stories... It's very um, confined to just these six episodes. We don't get a ton of backstory. We get a little bit where you just kind of get a general sense of who they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, they could even, you could argue they might even fall under character types of some sort as well. Um, I don't think fully though, because I do think they all are very distinct and have their own unique personalities. Some have overlapping characteristics Mm -hmm. um, as well. But Boko is sort of our main character, the young boy. And Joe is sort of this, I don't know if I want to call him a hothead per se. He can be. You can say Um, he was a little bit overprotective too, because you'll find out. Yes. You sort of find out as the mini series moves on. And kind of the reason why he sort of acts in a certain way. And then, too, he sort of like he sort of starts to get a bit more angry as time goes on. But then you'll kind of understand the reason behind it. I, I at first was starting to get a little bit annoyed with uh, the Joe character in a way until you kind of get sort of the, the main reason behind it. And then you start to understand uh, his uh, way of reacting to uh, a lot of the things that have been going on as time goes on. But, and, and I told Kent before we started uh, the episode here, at least they didn't have a Kenny <laughs> this time around. <laughs> yeah, I think to be perfectly honest, Joe is maybe the most fleshed out character out of the group here because we find out episode four i want to say it is that his mother and a sibling i can't remember if it was a a sister or brother they died in an accident and really ever since that accident his dad does nothing but sit at home and drink and therefore joe um kind of just takes care of his dad and himself um the parents of these kids other than brody whose dad is the general uh, in this mini series don't do a whole lot. I, I found it kind of strange though that they were more than willing to be okay with their kids being involved with the well, Eustace Foundation here. As, as far as Boko's mom, it seems like she was a little bit strict with how she um uh, acted towards him in a way and you know try to focus on his uh homework and his grades and, and all that stuff. And so she was kind of a bit over a little bit a little overprotective, just kind of like uh, Joe was. And Boko, you know, is like, yeah, you know, I'll take care of this later. Kind of just let me have my fun and summer vacation and all that. So, I mean, kids, kids going to kid, you know. <laughs> kids going to kid. <laughs> well, and like Joe is sort of the first of the group to really question the Eustace Foundation. Because he starts putting together just kind of weird things like, well, don't you guys think it's weird that we're involved here? Like that we're going on this sort of wild goose chase and that they're doing this and doing that. Like, don't you guys think this is a little off somehow? And there's this, um, not general, uh, he's either a lieutenant or a colonel in the Japanese military. We see him in the first handful of episodes. He's always eating some type of candy or something like that. And he's making paper versions of the oh, kaiju in question in those that, episodes. Uh, kind of that one uh, tank operator. Yeah. He was kind of interesting and weird, but yet his uh, story was pretty anticlimactic because he and his unit, tank unit, finally get involved in trying to shoot down the Queen Gauss along the shore there before it makes landfall, but then they all get toast. Uh, we never really find out much about him despite the fact yep. that he shows in virtually every episode yeah well and it's like i think the last time that you 
pretty much see him. It seemed like that he got like he had his head uh, hit hit the like the metal part of the tank somewhere. Even though he had a helmet on, then just gets knocked out. It didn't seem like I mean you would die from something like that because he you're wearing a helmet for that matter, right? And like his tank didn't explode or or anything, but yeah, other than that, you didn't didn't really see him much after that. But he did yeah. see uh, one of his uh, uh, fellow tank operators operating a different tank for that yeah. matter. Yeah, Tazaki um, ends up kind of being a character that is kind of sleazy for a while, but then he a little bit himself more or less towards the end. Well, no, I and, think he was sort of kind of pl- sort of planning it out, just trying not to give away too much. But he kind of, you know, when they when the kids were talking about, you know, when they see these visions and stuff, when they touch this aurelium uh, material, mm-hmm. and then. Um, and then just trying to deceive the foundation crew until it came to the right point and all that. Well, and it sounded like too, when he was talking to Emiko in episode five, I don't think he was aware that Emiko was going to turn on the Usus foundation and work with some of the other people within the foundation to go her own route. Uh, because he was definitely taken aback by that too. And you, yeah, you mentioned this element Aurelium. Uh, it definitely plays a huge part throughout most of the story. Ultimately, what we find out it, what it does is that it um, helps to heal and to some extent revive and give like power, extra power. That and I think uh, that and I think to uh, get control of the kaiju too. Because even Gamera, we find out, uh, is sort of made up of a lot of this Aurelium as well, like but like hundreds, if not thousands, of shards of of it. As we find out uh, in episode five, I think it is when he lands on the beach, and it's just he, his not only is his body glowing with it, like glitter, um, it's showering some of this too all over the beach mm. uh, as well. Um, and in fashion, regular camera fashion as well, boy, he gets the crap kicked out of him throughout the course yeah. of this series. And especially he's ticking. Well, especially once he faces uh, gear on there. Holy cow. He took quite a bit of damage when facing gear on there. Like get- He loses his right arm. Most of his right arm. Whoop. He gets one of the... Um, Oh, what are the Japanese stars, throwing stars called Sak- Sakuran or S- what are the Sh- Shirukin? Like, Shirukin, I think it is. Shirukin in his left eye. He s- somehow survives that. And then he gets like jabbed right in the center as well and keeps going. <laughs> keeps going. <laughs> <laughs> And what's interesting as well is that in that very final episode, when that Queen Gauss inserts whatever it is, some type of deal into Gamera through his mouth, if I understood it correctly, the uh, heads of the Usus Foundation that are located on the moon were saying what that does to Gamera is that it reverts him back. To yeah, his normal state from like ten thousand years ago or whatever. His yeah, because I think. Red. Yeah, because I think Gamera was part of their uh, plan, whole, whole plan, and part of the whole kaiju um, artillery before somehow he um, went rogue and all that. He went, he went rogue because, as we found out in that flashback, we see it twice. I think in like the final couple episodes where some guy hundreds of years ago got a special piece of Aurelium and like had it wrapped in some type of wire coil or something. And yeah. And Gamera was like down and hurt or something like that. And he put it like on his shell somewhere. And then that kind of broke some spell over Gamera. Mm -hmm. But the thing I hated about that final episode where after Gamera turns bad, so to speak, is that Boko yells at him for like a minute or two, like, Gamera, like, I know you're there, you know, you're good, it's, you know, 
I know it's inside of you. Gamera shrugs off. Yeah. Sort of evil part of him within a matter of moments. It, yeah. That, it's that same old movie trope where it's just like you find the strength inside of you and like you shake it off. Like I, I was didn't care for that. I was, I was sort of thinking that to myself so that that part <laughs> like it should have gone on a little bit more, you know, maybe have Gamera be in that form, maybe a, a little bit more. And you know, when they were by the lighthouse, kind of the Easter egg with the 1965 and everything, you should have had that kid go up the lighthouse or something of the <laughs> sort and then have him hang by, you know, the hand, you know, by the rail, kind of like the other kid from the original 1965 film. And then something happens there and then he shrugs it off or something. Who knows? <laughs> Well, they they could have I, taken advantage of that. Yeah, I, I didn't care for that. I want to talk about Joe, though, because he ends up sacrificing himself for the group. During the fifth episode in which they're trying to get away from Beerus and they're trying to get to a space station in between the Earth and the Moon, uh, they're on a rocket with Tazaki and one of the Eustis uh, pilots, but then... Uh, Vera shoots its laser and damages part of the shuttle. It kills the pilot guy, knocks out Tazaki. And so the kids are trying to get into this escape pod. And because the controls are damaged so much, they can't um, release the escape pod from inside the escape pod. Someone from inside the shuttle uh, has to release the valve to let that escape pod go. So Joe sacrifices himself um, i would say in quotes sacrifices because towards the very end i don't know if you saw the uh the post credit of oh, no, I the final episode where they kind of zoom in more on that uh, little tree house that they have and where uh boko uh laid that little communication device on the table you get to hear joe's voice saying are boko are you there and all that stuff so Pretty much you can say that Joe somehow survived. <laughs> That's creepy. Yeah. <laughs> that is creep. How could he have survived, though? Because didn't we see? I thought we saw the shuttle blow up. Did we? Or did we not? Not, not that I know of, because the, the one thing that came down and blew up that one um, area of the building where Emiko was, that was that was part of one half of Beerus there. Okay. So you didn't really know what happened after we last saw Joe. That's true, I guess, yeah. But I thought, at least, you know, as you're watching it, I was kind of almost moved to tears a little bit. Because here you have Joe, whose life, um, really ever since the tragic death of his sibling and his mother, his life just has not been the best. And he's been this big brother figure. And he and Boko, like, a little bit in the miniseries, kind of butt heads a little bit later. But then he sacrifices himself, supposedly. And yeah. um, it's very touching. You know, the one thing I'm going to have a little bit of a gripe uh, when it comes to this whole situation. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's going to be part of the story. And everything and and i get it but when it comes to you know things as far as um as far as trying to make having things the way that they are they should if they for a fail safe sort of thing like if one thing was malfunctioning as far as releasing the uh the escape pod from uh, the space shuttle, you would think that you would have had a manual thing within that uh, escape pod to eject it instead of just only having one thing on the outside. <laughs> Why not well, have it, both? I think it was, but because it got damaged, it didn't work inside the pod. I think that was the reason. Well, I think it was more, more or less an automatic thing, but... I, I don't know if they even had some source manual switch like they did on the other side. Why not just have another thing? Like yeah, but see, the manual safe. thing he did was he physically 
close those doors. He didn't push a button or anything. He physically closed them. Like, that's what he did. So, yeah. So, in a way, it did, but because of just the damage it, that shuttle took, it just couldn't do it from the pod. I have to say, though, too, like, when this um, miniseries ends, you know, you hear Boko kind of give this monologue for a bit. And I, I wish I could remember more as far as exactly kind of what he said. But it's very touching because he talks about, like, this was our last summer. And part of it was because, as we learned earlier in the miniseries, Boko's going to move. And one of the kind of the underlying um, lines that between he and Joe is Joe's always kind of like, keep learning to ride your bike, keep learning to ride your bike. But Boko gives this monologue where he's kind of like, this was our last summer. And not only was it the last summer that they were going to be together anyway, but because theoretically Joe died um, as well. But it almost seems to me too (laughs) that Boko could also even be saying that the kids themselves sort of lost a little bit of their innocence as children because of what they went through. Um, with the Kaiju and Uses Foundation and all that stuff. Um, it was kind of like sad, like sad, it not necessarily a touchy way, but sad and like this is tragic because these kids now, be, uh, due to what they went through, they, they can't be kids anymore. You know, they went through literal life and death situations and that, you know, it was traumatic. That messes with you. And, so, um, it, in a way, even though the miniseries ends off with the good guys winning and Gamera in some shape or form, we, we have yet to figure out if it's Gamera himself or a clone of some sort, Gamera lives in baby form and will, I think, eventually grow again. Uh, but it's still tragic because still a lot of people died from the military. Joe is maybe dead. And, um, you know, it's in this tragic loss of innocence of the four kids because of what they went through Mm -hmm. as well. Right. So on that note, um, what do you think of the visual effects? And then as far as the animation overall, what, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, well, for those who have not seen it, if you've watched uh, uh, if you've watched the anime Godzilla trilogy and or Godzilla SP, it's that type. Uh, it's sort of everything's done by computers now. Uh, it's similar to how most cartoons are done now. It's not hand drawn. It's through computers now. And I've heard a lot of people say, I guess they don't care much for this style of anime animation. And so I don't have a problem with it. But then again, too. I'm not a huge anime fan. I really don't watch the stuff. Um, I like it. I, I think it's flows smoothly. Um, I think it's a very well produced miniseries from a technical standpoint. I will say this though. And I told Jason this before we came on here uh, because Jason, this was his first time seeing it and he only watched it through the DVD he purchased I when I first watched this back in April, whenever it came out, I watched it over Netflix. And then the second time in preparation for this podcast, I watched it through the DVD. Um, it this series looks better if you stream it on Netflix. Uh, I even purchased a second DVD copy just to see if maybe there was something wrong with my disc. No, the exact same disc and stuff. There's still like some pixelation and the colors aren't quite as vibrant on the DVD version as they are through Netflix. So if you really want to appreciate the animation, the color palette, and just the overall design and layout of the series, you really want to watch it through Netflix. The DVDs aren't terrible, but they do hinder visually um, some of the, the grandeur that this series provides with its colors and its animation. Yeah. I would at least say if you don't, have a netflix and you refuse to do netflix due to price or 
tons of ads or whatever. Uh, yeah, I would, <laughs> I would, I would say the, the DVD route would at least be your best bet until it's still good until if they, whenever they bring out an official release or something with English, English audio and or subtitles, uh, to it. I'm not sure there is going to be any plans, uh, in that regard, in that matter, but yeah, if you don't necessarily have Netflix and refuse to DVDs, your route. If you're on Netflix, yeah, definitely do the Netflix route because I know he was asking me about that, and and, and I watched it through my uh, TV, and I got a like the the Ultra Blu-ray 4K uh, player, which should upscale things. I thought at first. Like it, it needed a little bit of time to uh, depixelate uh, the picture and everything, but it just kept going that way. It's like, oh, okay, so this is how it's going to actually look uh, in that regard. And also the DVD, for me, at the least, and I think in a couple episodes, it sort of froze for maybe about a second or two, but then went back to normal. So it seems like it's going to be uh, per DVD formatting um, per DVD, I would say, as far as the formatting, like some some may freeze for a second. Some may mind in. I might just mail you my second copy that way, <laughs> just in case. I don't know. I haven't gone through that second copy, but maybe that'll be better for you. Yeah, that's one of the things I thought was strange, at least when it came to the physical copy of this, because I got a, a physical copy of SP and the Godzilla anime trilogy, and both of those here, were yeah. just as good in the DVD format as they did on streaming. And why this Gamera miniseries got, like a mediocre DVD release is beyond me because yeah, I, 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 cause like I said, I got a second disc thinking maybe mine was flawed, but no, that's, that's, just I'm going to I'm gonna um, have to check. I'm going to have to check. See, um, obviously there should be like an actual Japanese release out there like maybe a 4k or blu-ray and just maybe check to see if there's uh, official english audio and subtitle but i know a lot of those official japanese releases tend to not do it but i just want to double check see if there is yeah it's just i i, I could i because i still can't figure out why um the dvd release of this is mediocre i i just i don't get that because, mm -hmm. like I said, the the other four titles that are anime from Netflix look pretty good on DVD. This one, for whatever reason, doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not terrible. I, I don't want to discourage anyone, but it's the, it's good, but it's not as good as it should be. And I think it was uh, re released by the same uh, DVD company somewhere in Asia. Yeah, somewhere. But yeah, it's the yeah. same one where it, it opens like, you know, the case opens like a manga, you know, yeah. backwards, so to speak. <laughs> but then I was <laughs> but then I was sort of confused that one when, when I opened that uh, DVD case that there were three extra empty areas where you have other yeah. additional DVDs. But you only just had had the one yeah, the disc. <laughs> and you know what? Now that I think about it, maybe that's the problem is that even though they could fit all six of those episodes on a DVD disc, that maybe because of compression in space, that could be, maybe that's the reason why the picture is like pixelated. Like if they had broken it up into maybe two DVDs, maybe it would have turned out better or three <laughs> Who knows? because you're talking about a mini series. If you go the average runtime route, let's just say each episode runs at 45 minutes for sake of argument. You're looking at like what a four and a half hour, I think four and a half hour, like a four and a half hour series, I believe, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. The Godzilla anime runs, I think, about six, six and a half, I think. 
And that's, you know, each film, granted they were films and they were released theatrically, but they had their own um, disc. This Gamera anime series, though, I think in Japan, I don't think it got theatrically released. I think it also went straight to streaming, if I'm not mistaken. I do believe so. Uh, Yeah, because I'm... It's like I'm looking at the Wikipedia because it says licensed by Netflix and released September 7th. So I'm not seeing anything as far as theatrical information. Yeah, because it's such a miniseries. Like I said, each, I mean, you know, each episode on average is running between like 43, 44 minutes. I mean, unless you were going to release it all as one giant chunk, uh, you know, which you're not probably going to do with Mm -hmm. like a four and a half hour movie with some exceptions um you know it's yeah yeah you're you're not going to release it theatrically you're going to throw it on streaming or something (laughs) but yeah now now that you think about as far as all the six episodes being on just one disc i would think that could be a reason why it's a bit downgraded as far as picture quality because, I mean, uh, nowadays, a lot, of, a lot of these movies are going to be uh, digital and then pretty good high quality. Because even, you know, when I export our episodes of video and stuff just in MP4 and either uh, 720p or 1080p uh, type of HD format, a lot of that stuff is going to be close to five gigs. <laughs> Yeah, at most. So that could be could be one of the reasons why. Because uh, I know as far as DVD, it can hold a certain amount of uh, gigs. I want to say there. old four, maybe. Here, let me quickly look it up. I would <laughs> probably would say six. I don't think it's that much. Um, four point seven gigabytes of data. Okay, that's so, what I'm. Saying. So essentially, uh, however, I will say this: single layer DVD does four point seven. Double layer is eight and a half. Okay. So, so maybe I think these are single layers. That or maybe close to a double layer. Who knows? <laughs> but see, here's the thing, though, too, and. Uh, yeah, I found this interesting because I found it, I think I read it last year on a random news article I found, that DVDs, uh, in t- it was either 2022 or 2023, were the um, most popular home video format that was purchased by people, So, which surprised me. I thought it would have just been Blu-ray, with maybe 4K coming in second and DVD coming in last. No, DVD was the biggest home video format seller. I have to say, though, um, given my experience, DVDs are still really good in terms of a format. Yes, if you're looking for sharper sound, you're not going to quite get it with the DVD. The vibrancy of colors, it's still actually there with a DVD, but to some level, it's just a little shy of like what a Blu-ray and a 4K can offer. But DVDs are still a great format. The only thing, here's the thing. A lot of these studios anymore, because I like, especially with some of my favorite movies, I love to have some behind the scenes featurettes. Um, So for whatever reason, a lot of these studios put a majority of them on the Blu-ray and 4K formats, but they at best may put like one featurette on the DVD format. So most of the time anymore, I buy, I buy the Blu-rays. Mm. And in some cases, yeah, all you can do is buy the Blu-rays. For example, the DC animated films that they make now, they only come in Blu-ray format or digital. Or some, One sometimes, of sometimes they'll have another additional disc just for behind-the-scenes stuff nowadays. Yeah, but they don't do that with DVDs anymore. Like Once Blu-ray came onto the scene and stuck around long enough, like kind of that's it like uh, studios don't invest in as much with the dvds anymore which is interesting because they are the 
that's I saw the highest selling video yeah. format. And and I know we're kind of going off on a tangent, but this will be my last piece on it. <laughs> but it's like, have you ever noticed that recently, you know, I think for a good portion of the time, I would say a good handful of years that they used to carry all three uh, formats into maybe like one or two versions of a package. But now it seems like they're just doing them all in their separate uh, package designs nowadays. I think it's a money saver, but I noticed this too. But also to get more money. (laughs) That too. Um, What I noticed, this is what happened when Zaslav became the new CEO of Warner Brothers within the last year or so. Before he came onto the scene, Warner Brothers media, every time like a major motion picture like a Godzilla 2014, Skull Island, King of the Monsters, um, even uh, Godzilla vs. Kong, when those came out on home video, yeah, you had a regular DVD format, you had the 4K, 4K with like a Blu-ray, yeah, and then they did the Blu-ray with a DVD and a digital code. But then when Zaslav came in, that all changed. You're getting either the DVD by itself <laughs> or the 4K with the digital code or the Blu-ray with the digital code. Mm-hmm. There is no uh, double packaging of this now. Unless the unless the movie's like really long or they're offering like major behind the scenes stuff in that extra or a special stuff. edition specials, yes. But they're not doing the double format release anymore. Nobody is. Mm-hmm. Like Disney was doing that a number of years before even Warner Brothers did it. Warner right. that's that was one of the things I loved about Warner Brothers was that you got both the DVD and Blu-ray for a number of years. <clears throat> in a release. Along, along not with, anymore. Along with not only those two formats, but a digital code to come with yeah so technically you got like three when if you bought the blu-ray or the 4k version Mm -hmm. but not anymore because zaslav's a piece of shit (laughs) but uh yeah we've gone off on the tangent with this whole formatting thing so you didn't know you were going to get a bonus discussion (laughs) on video formats did you (laughs) yeah so i think when we before we got into that tangent i think we uh we're tr- uh, going on as far as the visual effects and all this stuff here. So uh, the video the DVD more? format is good. Not as good as it should be. If you really want to appreciate it, you got to watch it on Netflix. So as far as the whole visual effects and stuff for me, and then I was telling this about uh, with Kent earlier, that um, I would say the settings and some of the visual effects were really good. As far as uh, the kaiju uh, models, uh, how they performed and all that stuff, I'd say it's really good. As far as the human character modelings on this, I felt like they needed to be a little bit more polished in a way, especially when compared to uh, the Godzilla anime trilogy and then SP. Uh, SP, I think, is probably the highest standard because it looked close to uh, like the, the, the traditional anime type of drawing in that regard. But the human character models in this one, it felt like it felt a little too robotic, but also not quite as polished compared to uh, SP in that regard. And and I was telling him that there was also another sort of substandard with some of the um, um, background characters. It seemed like that they weren't qu- quite as polished compared to the main and supporting characters. Because I sort of noticed that uh, uh, when comparing with the background characters and the supporting slash main characters, that yeah, they. I'm not sure how long that they had 
uh, when doing this uh, mini series uh, to get everything all animated and all that. They should have uh, given them, they should have gotten a, a little bit more time to kind of polish uh, the human models to make it at least decently believable and kind of blend in with the whole environment because I would say this is sort of a little bit of a deem for me because it they just felt like they they were that it felt a bit odd in a way when they were interacting with the environment it just felt sort of out of place a little bit Ooh. That's interesting because I disagree with you on that. I think it's up to the same standard that we've seen uh, in the past with the anime trilogy and then SP and even the one episode of the Ultraman anime that I saw however many years ago now it was. Um, again, I think you need to see it on Netflix because, again, I don't think the DVD format does it justice. Um because, I mean, all around, I thought the DVD format, yeah, just, it, it took quite a bit away from everything from a visual standpoint. Um, I, 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 I would check out the, the Netflix streaming version because I, I, I disagree with you on that. Well, I disagree with you, sir. Yeah, well, I, I disagree with your disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> well, I disagree with your agreement of agreement. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I think by and large, in a general sense, I mean, we've covered everything. I know we didn't uh, really go in deep detail, but there really what? isn't much, I guess. you. Could. I would say, what did you think of the music? It was fine. Um in, in many respects, though, when I did notice it, it did remind me a little bit of some of the Heisei music. Yeah, they but did. I they thought did. it was kind of downplayed. A little bit. I would say that there is one sort of music that did go along with the Heisei. Like, it, sound, it definitely had the Heisei uh, type of music, but sort of blended in. But also at the very end, when the whole miniseries is over, they did actually bring in the Showa uh, main theme, like oh, the like the camera, camera, yeah. Oh wow! But, but See, they, I didn't stick they, around for that. <laughs> but they didn't uh, have the kids saying; they just did the instrumental version of that. Oh, which was pretty cool. Oh, okay. It was more of a revised version of it. Okay, I get. I guess. Yeah, I. I um. Yeah, I, I like I said, I didn't stick around. Like once the credits, I listened to it for like maybe five seconds before turning it off. By the way, um, I've been wanting to. I almost forgot to bring this up. Um, if you listen, I don't know how it is like with the Japanese language and the English subs, but if you listen to the English dub, unlike the uh, Godzilla trilogy and Godzilla SP, there's a lot of swearing and it's hard swearing. In this miniseries, you got these uh, teens and tween characters using very harsh language, including the F bomb, like a handful of times over the course of this miniseries. Um, so, if you are at least listening to the English dub version of this miniseries, this is not something you want to have on with younger kids. Uh, yeah, around if that is something that is concerning to you yeah. and as far as the regular japanese version they didn't really say much of the swearing and all that maybe the closest would be shit and then mm -hmm. they'll and then i think uh joe probably i think was the only one that said the gd one and then maybe asshole <laughs> yeah, the F bomb has dropped. Like it's really dropped quite a bit in the first one, maybe two episodes, and then it comes back again later in episode either five or six. Um Yeah. But in a general sense, anyways, this series is sort of similar to the Heisei in its intensity, anyways. So um, you know, I don't know if it, I, I think even like not even thinking about the language part, 
just from the intensity standpoint, I still don't know if you necessarily want younger kids to watch this series. Um, not to mention, t- like, unlike Godzilla SP and the anime trilogy, the story here isn't quite... I, I don't want to say convoluted because that makes it seem like those stories are like impossible to understand. You can understand them if you just pay close enough attention, but it it is not as deeply involved as those two stories are. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I I don't know what I was eventually going to end up going with. Otherwise, <laughs> is there anything else you want to touch upon, or should we just kind of give our final thoughts on Gamer Rebirth? Uh, let's go to final thoughts and a letter grade. Okay, yeah. So, um, as far overall with uh, Gamer Rebirth, um, like I said, sort of at the beginning when they announced it and then revealed uh, like the designs of the monsters um, and the like. <clears throat> I was, you can say I was sort of um, ecstatic, but then I was like, I'm going to sort of kind of go into this kind of in the middle of the road, not to have that too high of expectations uh, with it. And then, uh, and then finding out that, um, that the uh, one of the vendors had um, uh, the DVD of Gamer Rebirth at uh, this past G Fest. There, wish they would have had a Blu-ray version of there, but oh well. I don't think uh, one exists that I'm aware of at the moment. No, not that I know. Especially with the anime uh, trilogy. I mean, it's made by or distributed by the same company, whichever it is. Um, and then looking at it. I, after watching Gamer Rebirth, I really liked how it is. It sort of kind of kind of goes by the same formula as, well, I mean, it, it's made by the same studio that did the Godzilla trilogy uh, several years ago. And they sort of kind of went by sort of the same formula uh, in a way. But uh, I really liked how they still, uh, you know, have the kids involved with the whole gamer thing, but then also kind of add in some more of the adult element to it, kind of like the first two films. And by the way, I'm not sure why they didn't <laughs> bring in Barugan for that matter, but that's that's for another day. And that's Kadokawa Dai to uh, answer that question. Um, yeah, I was really surprised by how the miniseries went and how the story, um, was made. And then the characters, I was surprised by how the characters were executed here. And even the, especially the Kaiju, uh, that exceeded my expectations for that matter. And, um, and of course, uh, no fault of its own as far as the quality of the DVD and probably his compression reasons to fit them all in one disc and not even sure the reason why they didn't try to put them on two or possibly three. Because, uh, I mean, they all, they had that, they had plenty of room to add at, up to four <laughs> in that DVD case there. Uh, yeah, it, the story was good um i would at least for now kind of dean it a little bit as far as the uh human uh character models uh for this but uh overall i really liked how things went uh with the gamera uh mini series here unfortunately it seemed like uh it didn't quite do as good um uh, in general with some of the uh the other uh reviewers and uh there's a reason for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah fuck themselves. Uh <laughs> uh 
right on. <laughs> yeah, and I really liked how uh, the the finished product of the mini series for. So I would say, as far as the final letter grade for Gamma Rebirth. I'm going to give this um, a B plus for the time being. Yeah. I, you know, when we talked about the post G Fest show, I had mentioned on there, I was a little surprised that there weren't panels on the um, 25th anniversaries of Gamera three and Godzilla 2000, uh, considering both movies and more specifically Gamera three, considering how popular that one is that no one did a, panel on it this year yeah. and then i remember too oh crap like this game our rebirth came out earlier in the year too to where unless maybe like a uh, panel space was full i was surprised that no one um had this as a panel discussion as well but then i started thinking i'm like you know what actually i shouldn't be shocked because here's the deal and this is the gloves coming off again. Again, if you haven't seen my little mini video on YouTube, uh, you know, that will do a little bit better job of explaining what I just said there. Western Kaiju fans suck. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. They do. Because here's the deal. Um, out of all the G-Fests in recent years, there's all, and, and when you look at the anime stuff, the anime Ultraman, Godzilla Singular Point, the anime trilogy, and now this. Only one of them has gotten one panel at a G-Fest, and that was the anime trilogy that was in 2019, if I am not mistaken. And it was a terrific panel. Uh, it really, I think, for those like myself who uh, don't understand anime a whole lot and understand some of the individuals, especially the director behind some of the projects like the Godzilla anime trilogy, it really explained an awful lot of why that trilogy was made the way that it was, even though I love that trilogy. I mean, I was saying it on here before I even went to that panel. When we covered those movies on this podcast before that particular G-Fest, I said those anime trilogy of films are some of the best written Godzilla material to date. And I still stand by that. I still think they are some of the best written Godzilla stories so far uh, that we've ever seen. Singular Point, I think, is very similar. Singular Point, I will say, does get maybe a little more convoluted than um, the anime trilogy, but it still all makes sense. You just need to either watch it multiple times or pay really close attention. And if you have to go to the bathroom, pause it, then come back and start it again. Because it, like almost every second of those movies, if you miss something, you could be very confused moving forward uh, throughout those movies or miniseries. Um, Western fans always talk about, and I've seen a lot of complaints about this from older nonsensical fans when they criticize the monster verse and that, you know, they say it's not well written and blah, 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 not realizing that the monster verse is not dissimilar from how the Godzilla franchise initially started over 70 years ago. You get something like gamma rebirth or these other anime movies or miniseries. These are all well written. And yet fans complain about how bored they are or how they think they aren't good. And a lot of it is because Western Kaiju fans mentally are lazy. They are. Part of that is sadly due to our culture here in the States. A lot of people, when it comes to their entertainment, don't want to use brain power to pay careful attention and to try to follow a deep story. And that's the problem. A lot of Western fans want Monster Smash. That's all they want. There's nothing wrong with that. But I don't want every single kaiju story that is on either the big screen or the small screen to be that i or of course be, also or to be literally the same thing over and over again but just right. different kaiju 
Right. And I don't want all kaiju films and stuff to be incredibly involved stories either. I want a mixture. I want variety. But there, and I'm not saying that people have to like these. I'm not saying that. But there should be at least some appreciation for what has been attempted with these animes. Because these are, in many ways, deep, thought-provoking, well-written stories. And Western kaiju fans are mentally lazy. Because I still, I will go to my grave saying that the Godzilla anime trilogy is some of the best writing I've ever seen in a kaiju story. And then the one thing I want to add in, too, is that I know there's a lot of anime out there that are going to be straightforward, but there is going to be some of those anime that, um, like, once every while or so, there's going to be one that's going to have a lot of good story, but it's going to be a bit complicated and all that. And a lot of people just don't pay attention to a lot of those. And these are sort of one of those. Anyways, they just tend to watch animes out there. I'm part of that too, <laughs> that are straightforward. And sometimes that's, you know, fun and fun and all, but, um, but again, there's going to be some of those that are going to be well thought out, put together, but also convoluted, maybe a bit confusing too. So you got kind of get off that uh, lazy horse and <laughs> turn on your brain once a while. <laughs> Use it. Because otherwise and you're going to develop Alzheimer's or dementia later. And granted, <laughs> it's it's fun to kind of turn off your brain and kind of watch some of these Nothing wrong uh, popcorn movies and stuff. Yeah. You know, just to try to get away from certain things in your life that might be a bit yeah. complicated or you may have a bad day or something. Yeah, go right ahead. But as far as some of these sort of things, you might need to have your brain turned <laughs> once a while. Well, yeah. And yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, I'm not, again, I'm not saying you have to like them, but I'm saying at the bare minimum, you should be appreciative of what they are trying to do and accomplishing pretty well for the most part. With that said, though, I will say this. Gamera Rebirth is nowhere near as convoluted as SP or the anime mm -hmm. trilogy. It is definitely more straightforward. But I would also say, too, that even though the writing here, I think, is very it's, good, it's I would not say it's, as good. I would say it's a bit it's, mixed on, in a way, where it's straightforward, I, I, but then a little bit of elements of Yeah, story. I would say the writing quality for Rebirth, if I'm comparing it with SP and the anime trilogy, is like a step down. That still doesn't mean it's terrible. It's not. It's better written than probably all the show with Steph. Uh, Baragon might be the only one that I may be like, well, I don't, I don't know one or the other. Um, but um, it's, I would say, almost on par with the Heisei series in terms of its writing. The character work, though, I will say, unlike SP and the anime trilogy, is not as um, thorough. Uh, I would say you get just enough material with our main characters to get a general sense of who they are and where they're coming from. Uh, the kaiju model is fantastic. I like the new looks. I like the new representations, both not just in their physical features, but in their abilities uh, as well. Um, it's fantastic. I mean, like I said uh, earlier in this particular episode, um, I got the, the uh, he's sitting up there. I got the anime camera figure um, earlier in the year. And then at G-Fest, I got the rest of the crew. And how come Banda never made the queen gas is beyond me. But uh, even my son uh, at this year's G-Fest got all the anime camera characters because uh, he thought they were pretty cool. <laughs> I love the representation of the kaiju here. I love the fact that Virus kind of this goofy kaiju that I think a lot of us love, but uh, uh, kind of poke fun of at his own movie. That guy's a badass here. Um, they all are, really. But Virus, I think, comes off more as a badass because in his own movie, 
I don't think he necessarily got the badass treatment like a Jiger and a Gauss uh, do. Zegra didn't quite get that treatment, but even Zegra comes off really good here as well. Giron comes off even more as a badass here. I mean, just the fact that they someone was like, hey, let's have him do this ability where he kind of like flips and it gives him more uh, of, a, of an oomph to his knife chopping ability. I mean, it's fantastic. I never would have come up with that. So um, the representations and the designs of these kaiju are just phenomenal. Um, it's entertaining. These uh, episodes on average are anywhere between like 42, 44 minutes. I think, the, like I said, I think the longest one is like 46 minutes. Um so they don't take up a ton of time. Uh, it's very touching and moving in parts. It's even funny in some ways uh, as well. As spe- we didn't talk about it, but when Brody finds out Junichi is a girl, <laughs> that was kind of funny. Um, but um, it's, you know, it's a fun time. It is a little bit more involved than much of the Showa Gamera series is. Uh, definitely, I would say not for younger audiences, especially the English dub due to the intense amount of swearing, especially in two or three of the, the episodes. Um, but this is this is a, a mildly thought provoking uh, mini series that is entertaining and pretty well done. I would say its quality, though, in terms of its writing is not on the same level as SP in the uh, Godzilla anime trilogy, but it's still really good. Um, It's unfortunate because the, um, the Ultraman miniseries, when those three seasons came out, I never saw anybody talk about them. Really? Uh, The Godzilla anime trilogy movies, people did talk about because Godzilla of course is, is a bigger character, more well-known. Obviously they got lambasted very unfairly. SP was kind of in the same boat. People were hyped about this. I remember when uh, like a teaser trailer for this came out late last year, I believe it was. People were hyped about it. But then when it came out on Netflix back in April, silence, like nobody was talking about it. Um, This, along with all the other anime stuff, needs to be checked out. It is pretty well made. And I think fans of Gamera will find a couple of Easter eggs along the way, but I think also be very appreciative of the new things that they did here uh, with the characters, more specifically the Kaiju themselves. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I'm given Gamera Rebirth an A minus. I'm given a, a, the minus just because again, I don't think the characters are quite uh, as fleshed out as they could have been. And I think the story in a couple of spots uh, could have been done just a little bit better. Uh, but it's still fantastic mini series. If you're a Gamera fan, I think you will enjoy this. I think especially if you are a fan of the Heisei series, which if you're a Gamera fan, you definitely check out the Heisei series. And I don't know really anybody who doesn't like the Heisei trilogy. Um, yeah, I, I think you will enjoy this. I highly recommend it. I give it an A-. minus. It's it's a fun, fun time and a, and a nice new twist on the Gamera characters, just like the other anime stuff was a nice uh, twist on Godzilla. And the one episode of Ultraman that I saw of the anime, it was a, a nice little twist on that particular character as well. And I'm looking forward to seeing that with um, like another month or so down the road when we cover that. So, mm. yeah, uh, fantastic. I recommend it. Awesome. Well, that pretty much concludes uh, this uh, episode of the Go Go Kaiju Show here. So thanks for watching. And um, <laughs> and again, if you are watching us at uh, one of the video platforms, if you see a subscribe button down below or above wherever you're watching us, make sure to hit that subscribe button as well as smash the like button. And uh, if you're listening to us on any of the available uh, audio uh, podcast uh, platforms, make sure to subscribe to us at, at your uh, favorite uh, podcast uh, platform there. So then next time we'll be uh, covering um, the Ultraman Rising movie 
that's on uh, Netflix here. Uh, so we're going to be doing, and then also we're going to be due to uh, college football season beginning. We always at the priority time of the year. <laughs> yes. Priorities. So at this time of the year, we're switching our, uh, podcast timing from Saturday to Sunday until the college football season is over with. And uh, what, what was your, the thing that you wanted to mention? If I can preview Ultraman Rising because I've already seen it, um, I will say this. When it came out on Netflix here a month and a half or two ago, a lot of people were ranting and raving about it, which is like one of the first things <laughs> Like the only animated thing I saw people actually talking about since the Godzilla anime trilogy and actually enjoying it, I will say this. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say this. And I'm going to, this is kind of a big preview of my thoughts on it already. Ultraman Rising is one of those where I think if you have younger fans, that movie's for them. Longtime fans may not care as much for it. And you will see why when we discuss it here in a couple <laughs> weeks. <laughs> All right. So with that, thank you for watching another episode of the Go Go Kaiju Show. And we'll see you guys next time. Take care. Don't be lazy. Don't be lazy.